Alrighty. So let's begin in Colossians chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. Colossians chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. Specifically, verse 3 is what the real focus is. For I want you to know how great a struggle I have for you, and for those at Laodicea, and for all who have not seen me face to face, that their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love to reach all the riches of full assurance of understanding and the knowledge of God's mystery, which is Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. In whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Now let's also turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 6. And these verses will guide our six weeks together. They will be sort of the foundation. Very good verses to have on your mind as we're talking about these things. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, starting in verse 14. Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. For what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness? Or what fellowship has light with darkness? What accord has Christ with Belial? Or what portion does a believer share with an unbeliever? What agreement has the temple of God with idols? For we are the temple of the living God. As God said, I will make my dwelling among them and walk among them, and I will be their God and they shall be my people. Therefore go out from their midst, and be separate from them, says the Lord, and touch no unclean thing. Then I will welcome you, and I will be a father to you, and you shall be sons and daughters to me, says the Lord Almighty. Since we have these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from every defilement of body and spirit, bringing holiness to completion in the fear of God. Amen. So in Christ are all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge, and essential to this call of God to be his children is to come out of the world, be separate from it. Okay? Uh, so we're going to do six weeks on worldview. Uh, today and next week are specifically more general things. So today we're going to primarily be talking about what is a worldview. Next week we're going to be talking about the importance of having a Christian worldview, the importance of thinking like a Christian, uh, having biblical lenses on as you interpret the world and view the world. And then we're going to dive into uh, hot topics. It's going to get spicy, in other words. We're, uh, week three is going to be uh, culture and government. Week four is going to be racial injustice and a, a critique of the social justice movement as well. Week five is going to be sexual orientation. And week six is going to be gender identity. So we're going to kind of hit all the hot, all the hot topics. Um, the question then is, why, why now? That's not already evident. I mean, things are kind of heating up, right? That's kind of the reason. But, but why, why now? I would say there's a, there's a new world religion. It's becoming more and more evident that it is a religion. You can call it... A number of things. You can call it leftism, you can call it secularism, you can call it progressivism, um, Marxism, whatever you want to call it. It is the new orthodoxy, and it's clear. And you, as Christians, are the heretics in this new system. You are the, we are the non elect in this new season, uh, in this new system. The, uh, in the early church, they used to have to pinch incense at the altar of Caesar and say, Kaiser Kurios, right? And obviously Christians would reject that. They wouldn't do it. Obviously some would. Uh, but that was the command, right? You have to pinch incense and say, Caesar is Lord. In other words, Jesus is not. Today, in our culture, you are commanded, not to the same extent, but at least culturally, you are commanded to say there's no difference between men and women. The role of the government is to be primarily compassionate, therefore give them more power. America was founded on racism. Abortion is health care. Uh, men can magically turn into women if they feel like it. And the list goes on and on. Jesus uh, is not the only way. Right? You could say multiple things here, uh, but this is the new orthodoxy, and they are, 
they desire to redefine the world around us. And if you disagree with the Orthodox, then what happens? You're canceled, you're called a bigot, you're called a white supremacist. And even if you're a minority on that side, then what happens? It's, you're, okay, you're not white, so you're not a white supremacist, but you're complicit in the system of white supremacy, and therefore guilty, because you're participating, even unknowingly, in this system, and therefore you are guilty. So we are no longer accepted, by and large, as, as normal, and that's increasing and increasing. So that's why I do this study now. We need to have a Christian worldview. We need to think about these cultural issues properly. Um, and that's what we're going to be doing uh, through the coming uh, weeks. We, we, especially today, because the battle is heating up, have to think like Christians in every area of our lives. Uh, so our outline for today is what is a worldview? Then number point two, no one is neutral. There's no neutrality. Very important. Then we're going to look at the components of a worldview, which this helps us uh, look at. And epistemology, which sounds uh, intimidating, but I promise you it's not, as you will see. All right. First, what is a worldview? When you when you hear the when you hear the term worldview, what are some of the things that you think about? Okay. Is that what you mean? Is that what you're asking? No, more like a definition of worldview. But but that is a good point that. There is an evolutionary worldview out there. That's true. But more like, just in a general way, how do you define the term worldview? The lens through which you see the world and, and understand it. That's good. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah ways good to in, interpret how things are. Good. Good. Very good. Yes. Anyone want to add to that? How do you decide what's right and wrong? Good. Yeah. Mm-hmm. With a worldview would typically come a standard of authority, uh, morality, and ethic. Yeah, mm -hmm. That helps you make decisions. That's good. Um, one way to define it I, I have here is it's the way that one organizes the world around them in order to make sense of it. And it's all rooted in their ultimate concern or their God. The word was first used by Immanuel Kant, a philosopher, Use that as he used it like a sense perceptions, like how your senses perceive the world. But it became uh, kind of shifted as other philosophers and thinkers utilized the term, just to, as you guys definitely nailed it, as a, as a framework that people have to look at the world. A framework. What are your lenses? What are your assumptions? Uh, another way, it's a it's a system of thought in which a group um, of people utilize. To organize the world around them. Let's look at a couple passages here as we follow this train of thought. Uh, go to Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. Starting in verse 18. Romans 1.18. The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world and the things that have been made, so they are without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. Therefore God gave them up in the lusts of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshipped and served the creature rather than the Creator who is blessed forever. Amen. All right. So apart from Christ, we worship creatures. We worship the creation. We have other gods. If, if we're not, if we're not, if we're not uh, worshiping the true God, we're worshiping something. In other words, all men are worshipers. Therefore, none are neutral. It's not whether you're going to worship something. 
It's who are you worshiping? That's the real question. Who, who are you going to worship? So, and, and therefore, all have a worldview. All have a, have a way that they look at the world because all have an ultimate concern. All have a God of sorts that they are worshiping. All have an idol that they are worshiping and therefore all have a worldview. Psalm 115, just for the sake of time, we won't go there, but it teaches that we become, we end up becoming like what we worship. Right? It says, uh, those who, um, it goes through idols who have uh, ears uh, but can't hear and eyes but cannot see. And it says, those who make them become like them and so do all who trust in them. Right? So we end up becoming like what we worship. So all men worship something. They all have a worldview. None are neutral. And they end up becoming like what they're following. Okay? Very important. So this is point two. No one is neutral. Everyone has a way that they view the world. You might have heard an unbeliever tell you or tell someone else, uh, you know, you trust your dumb Bible that was written a long time ago. I don't know why you trust that thing. I have science. I have reason. Right? If you've heard that, that is completely absurd because they're, they're actually believing that they are neutral somehow and that they don't have confidence in something. That they're not placing their confidence and their confide with trust from the lab, with trust. They're not placing their trust in something. Yet, they are. It's not that I'm a Christian and you're standing in this neutral zone and therefore you have the upper hand. No, I have a worldview. It's a Christian worldview. You have a worldview, whatever that may be. Let's figure that out. And therefore, the issue is, am I right? Is my worldview right or is your worldview right? Or are they both wrong? It's not that I have a worldview and you don't, and so you're superior, which is how they often twist that. But that's not the case. They have a system of thought. They have a God of their system, an ultimate concern, even if it's not clearly defined as God. Uh, We know as Christians that they have one. So this can be very helpful in pointing out to someone, especially one way to, to really bring this out and to show them is that to prove the Bible... Yes, I would go to the Bible because it's an ultimate authority. If it wasn't an ultimate authority, I would go to other things to prove it. But it is. It's an ultimate authority, so I, I, it, nothing's higher than it. So I can't go to other things to prove it. I have to go to it to prove it because it's an ultimate authority. But guess what? How do you prove that your reason, let's say their authority is reason. How do you prove that your reason is the ultimate authority without using your reason? Right? You have to use reason to argue for reason as the ultimate authority. So we're in the same boat. Your ultimate authority is reason. You have to use it to argue for it. My ultimate authority is the Bible, and I have to use it to argue for it. So it's, it's not this, and, and I'm sure you know what I'm talking about. They really make themselves seem like they have the upper hand. They're not religious. They just use science. But no, they have a worldview. I have a worldview. We're in the same boat. And um, pointing that out to someone is often helpful because they've typically never heard that frame of thought before because they're just... They're living in this world that just assumes that the religious people are crazy and they're the smart, you know, reasonable ones. So sometimes when you point that out, that can be useful. But that's the key here. No one is neutral. Not one person is neutral. And even some unbelievers point this out. Let's look at some quotes here. I think I put them on your sheet. John F. Hott, a philosopher, not a Christian. He points out that the modern, uh, he's speaking particularly of like people like Richard Dawkins and Christopher Hitchens and modern um, atheists, but this can apply across the board to, to, you know, someone who just says, I'm not religious, but I'm spiritual and more of a progressive type. Um, it can really apply to any unbeliever, I think. And this is what he says. The very passion of their protests erupts from the deep font of a native trust in reason an ultimate concern that has grasped hold of them and to which they have surrendered in fiduciary reverence. In this sense, they are as religious as anybody else. So they have not severed their ties with the rest of humanity after all. You see, (laughs) they, they have a worldview. They're religious in their own way and so are we. It's not an issue of Obviously, I'm right because I'm not religious. It's an issue of which worldview is correct. And that's it. Let's figure that out. So everyone has a worldview. Paul Tillich, a philosopher, probably would consider himself a theologian. 
I, I wouldn't. Uh, he was a, um, a, a liberal Lutheran, I believe. Um, uh, not someone recommended, but he is helpful at this point. He defines religion as, a, as being grasped by an ultimate concern. And that's where hot of the quote above gets that term ultimate concern. So being grasped by an ultimate concern. So if, if you understand that essentially everyone is innately religious, as Ecclesiastes says, eternity is written on, on man's heart, right? And that all men worship something. Uh, then the world suddenly opens up and you start to realize we're not in a different boat than everyone else. We, I mean, other than the fact that we have the truth, right? We have the correct worldview. But we're not in a different boat as, as if we have a worldview and no one else does or other people don't. No, everyone has a, a way that they view the world. He goes on, uh, Tillich also points out that religion is the substance of culture, which I do want, want you to keep that in your mind as well. Uh, Henry Van Til uh, said that religion is culture externalized. So, so it, it, or culture is religion externalized, sorry. So in other words, the culture that you see around you, whatever that looks like, uh, that is the way it is because of the religion of the people of that culture. Okay? So culture is, is religion externalized. Or as, as Tillich uh, says, religion is the substance of culture. So something to keep in mind as we're going through these weeks, very important. So, that's the point here. No one is neutral. The secularist wants you to believe that, you're, that they're neutral. They want you to leave your worldview at the door or at home before you interact with them in the public square. But here's the thing. They're not leaving theirs at home. What's the assumption? I have the right worldview. You don't. Therefore, you leave it at home. You become... You take upon my worldview when you interact with me here. And that's fair. No, it's not. <laughs> You're missing the... You have a worldview, I have a worldview. And we have to interact regardless. And I'm not leaving mine at home because you don't leave yours at home. It's a lot easier to get your agendas pushed through if you have... You've convinced everyone that they need to leave theirs at home and theirs is the correct one to have in the public sphere. But Christians never believe that. We always believe Christ in public. Right? Be Christians everywhere you are, right? That's we, we don't believe we live our leave our Christianity at home. All right. Now, all worldviews. Let's look at the components of a worldview. All worldviews have narratives, catechisms, rituals, and lifestyles. So let's look at this thingamajig here. This is you can call this the worldview spokes. All right, the axle is grace, the grace of God in the gospel. Making the whole thing go. Surrounding it, the lordship of Christ. And here's a different component of worldview. All right, we got catechesis. All right, all worldviews have a catechism. Now, obviously, in our worldview, we have a literal catechism. But not all worldviews have a literal one. But they have creeds. They have, um, you, you know, you can ask, and we'll get in that. You can ask someone uh, today who's a, your typical kind of progressive, secular person a question um, and you know how they're going to answer. Right. There's a catechism. There's lifestyle. We get that. You know, Narratives. Every worldview has narratives that they believe. Things that they believe about the world. Right? There's an evolutionary narrative. Right? So that would be an example. And all worldviews have rituals. And, and these sometimes are obvious. Like for us, Lord's Supper and Baptism. Obvious rituals. You know, preaching. Uh, but some of these aren't obvious. Sometimes rituals are, you can't really see them. And that's somewhat the, someone explained, uh, that's somewhat the power of a ritual. Sometimes you just forget they're there. You just, you just do it. You know, like, why is the pulpit in the center of the Protestant worship service uh, building? That was, a, that was a shift. We changed that in the time of the Reformation. The pulpits weren't in the center. Why did they move to the center? Well, because the word is center, right? Why does Pastor Bob stand behind the table? of the Lord's Supper and not in front of it. Because he's not blocking you from the supper. He's not a priest. He's not mediating. Jesus is the mediator. So Protestant pastors stand behind. The reformers stood behind the Lord's table. So they're not blocking their people from it. They're not standing in front of it like a priest. And you can't get to it through me. You have to, to get to it, you have to get through me. So those are some, some rituals. And sometimes you don't see why they're there. But they're all worldviews 
have them. So let, let's go through some of these. Um, first, give me some Christian, let's start with Christian narratives. Maybe give me some examples of a Christian narrative. Big picture, you know. In the beginning, God created heaven and earth. Boom, good. Probably the most important Christian narrative. Yes, anything else? Christ crucified. Christ was crucified, he was buried, he rose again from the dead. That happened? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah Christ. I was thinking about the, the sacrifices throughout the Old Testament, how, how Christ fulfills all of that, how it all points mm-hmm. towards him. Right. That's good. Mm-hmm. Good. Anything else? Narratives, narratives. We can uh, we can we can say also God created you know speaking to our culture today God created man and woman right that's it male and female it's good good narrative all right what about well with the rituals what about some catechisms Catech- or creeds what are some creeds or catechism questions that we believe love your neighbor as yourself good yeah yeah let's be like let's not just be Presbyterian when I say this would be Think Christian in general. Who is Jesus? The God man. Right? Anything else? Anyone thinks? Well, similarly, the Trinity. Okay, right? Doctrine of the Trinity. Right? All Christians are hold to that. Man is the head of the household. Mm -hmm. Good. There's tons of stuff like that. All All right. Lifestyle. How are Christians supposed to live? All to the glory of God. All to the glory of God. Good. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Not, uh, they're supposed to put off the flesh, put on Christ, right? All right, so we get it. Now let's talk about some secular, what are some secular narratives? I think they, obviously there's different ones, you know, there's slight variations, but what are some common things you hear in our culture today from your typical non Christian? No truth. All right, yeah, that's a big narrative, kind of the postmodern. Uh, idea uh, that all truth is relative. Your truth is your truth. My truth is my truth. That's a that's a big one. I was born that way. I was born that way, right? That's a very good one. Mm-hmm. Evolution. Evolution, right? Right. Which really bleeds into a lot of this. Mm-hmm. A lot of secular thinking kind of stems from that uh, because it's a system of thought uh, that that you know puts God out of the picture. Um, and a foundational. Yeah, it's very foundational, right? And everything right. built upon that is mm-hmm. going the direction. Right, right. Yeah, if, if our ancestors were fish and we came from the slime and, and we're constantly mutating and changing, although slowly, why can't I decide to be a woman today? Why can't I wear a dress as a man? Who, who says so? No one. I came from the mud, so did you, whatever. Who cares? Um, liberal catechisms. Common things that, that you know. They believe that uh, everybody is equal from birth to death, where we believe everybody is equal at birth and not guaranteed the same end result. Right, that's true. Right. Okay. right. So Jesus was a good man, a good teacher. That's good. That's about it, right? Yeah. <laughs> Right? Until they actually read the Gospels and they say, oh, he was a bigot. He was, he was hateful. Most of them who say that you know, don't, have never actually read the Bible, where Jesus gets pretty intense at times. Um, so, uh, ri- rituals. Or wait, well, one more here that I, I think of is, what is love? Whatever, I'm, whatever I say. Whatever makes me feel good. Whatever, yeah, whatever makes me feel good today. Uh, what about ritual? Excuse me, rituals. Pagan or Christian rituals or world rituals? Oh, they're worldly rituals. Kind of, kind of common today, like something that you may see that you think, oh, that's, that's like a liberal ritual. I'll read it. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, to a certain to a certain extent, depends on, you know. There's definitely, so, yeah. yeah. Um, Actually, all right. That's good. Yeah, that's good. That's a good one. Yeah, a pride parade. Yeah, that's a good one. Yep. Every year. Mm-hmm. They yeah. say take it 
Christian, not really ritual, but celebration, it's like the celebration of the birth of Christ, Christmas. But the birth of Christ isn't even at, at the center of it. Mm -hmm. It's all about Santa Claus and being good. Warm fuzzy feelings. Yeah, warm mm -hmm. fuzzy feelings. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Not necessarily the rich shirt, but it's about the yeah. eggs and the bunny. Yeah. <laughs> and everybody is like that there hopping. You got the car and you got the hopping. You know, rituals can also be like a tradition that people just do without thinking. And, and one thing you can notice is the shift in how particularly women dress. It used to just be normal uh, that a woman would wear certain things. Yeah. You know, now it's just normal uh, that the skirts are super high and the shirts are very revealing and, and they don't think about it. It's not, it's not thought about. It, and that's a hint. That's a ritual. That's a tradition. Because they don't realize they're doing it half the time. I remember when as a nurse wearing a uniform, I always wore a dress. Most everyone did. Mm -hmm. And the change is what I remember this. Change had to being able to wear pants. You came up when you wore the pants too, right? Right. And uh, it was then it was all about the caps all the blue with the pants. You know? Yeah. <laughs> I still was not wearing caps. <laughs> and having your school pin and that could be any anymore. So mm -hmm. it's in the drawer. <laughs> and, you know, right. just a whole lot of things just in mm -hmm. Right, right. Little little rituals that just slowly change or drift off. But before you, it would just be normal. You didn't think about it. Yeah. That's yeah good. People weren't in uniform. It used to be you could tell by the length of the lab coat, the whether the you know, position they was the doctor. Yeah. And, yeah. and there there were different lengths that would tell you who was who. It's hard to tell anymore. Right. Who's going around in scrubs? But well, the they they the color. colors. There's certain colors. Oh, okay. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, I always get confused which color is what. Yeah. Well, heart is red. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> right. But yeah. But that was the film point of patients. They never knew who was in their room. Who was who? Yeah. So they just put everybody in color. Who's a doctor? Who would are you? All right. So that's, this is uh, very important to keep in mind. Rituals, catechisms, lifestyle, narrative. Not just as we evaluate our view of the world to make sure that we're viewing the world as Christians properly, with a full orb to Christian worldview, but also as we look at other worldviews uh, to consider them. Uh, that's an important little chart there. Alright, so we've talked primarily about three things. A worldview is the way that one organizes the world around them. This is on your sheet. Uh, in order to make sense of it, rooted in their ultimate concern, or God. And God is small g, because I'm primarily talking about other worldviews. Uh, for us, I would, I would I would just put big G there, obviously, just for the record. Not that I need to say that. But anyway. uh, two, everyone has a worldview, which means no one is neutral. There's no neutrality. There's no neutrality on planet Earth. Don't believe that. Everyone has, uh, has a worldview. Everyone is biased in, in their own way, etc. All worldviews have narratives, catechisms, rituals, and lifestyles. And now another aspect of worldview that's vital to understand is something called epistemology. Has anyone ever heard that term? It sounds intimidating, but I'll explain. Okay, it's just a branch of philosophy uh, which, which deals with the study of knowledge, particularly the grounds of knowledge. So it deals with the question, what do you know, or excuse me, how do you know what you know? Right? How do you know, particularly, how, what are the grounds of your knowledge? How do you know what you know? How do you know that what you believe is true? Okay. Our world today, I think by and large, without most people realizing, have bought into a branch of the branch, right? So there's philosophy, epistemology, which is a type of philosophy, and then underneath that would be a type of epistemology, which is called standpoint epistemology, which basically means, how do you know what you know? Well, your victimization status really tells you. Uh, it really determines knowledge. So th this is what I mean. It, 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 came, it came to be, uh, you, you basically come to know the truth through the lens of an oppressed person or an oppressed class. That's how we come to know the truth in this system of thought. And this is by and large, a lot of people believe this. Even without knowing that it's called standpoint epistemology. Uh, this, is, this is dangerous. We're going to come back to this when we talk about racial injustice. Because... Uh, 
you probably can already see how that connects. Uh, but you hear it a lot today. You hear, hey, pastors, you need perspective. You need perspective to really understand injustice. You need to sit with the minority people in your congregation and listen to them and then go back to your Bible. You see, well, what should we actually do if we understand this? Well, okay, no. I'm going to read my Bible and I'm going to believe what it says about injustice. Whatever that may be. And then I'm going to sit with the people in my congregation who may, may or may not have been oppressed. And I'm going to help them interpret that properly, biblically, the way God wants them to interpret it. So yes, yeah, sit with them. But what a, a person who is uh, knowingly or unknowingly believing the standpoint of epistemology uh, does is they take the lens of the victim's experience and, and use that to look at the Bible. That's the lens that they're looking at the Bible with. Okay? So notice, here's just one example in our culture of this. Notice how certain politicians use victims of gun violence to argue against the Second Amendment. Why do they do that? Well, because that's the source of authority. How could you argue against this girl who lost her mother? How could you? Don't you see her crying? Right? Because this is the source of authority. It's this girl crying. It's She knows better than you. Because she has been a victim of violence. You haven't. Now hopefully you can already see how that is kind of foolish. Because obviously, you know, simply because you've had brain surgery doesn't mean you're going to be a good brain surgeon. Right? <laughs> you still want the brain surgeon. So in other words, a brain surgeon doesn't need to have brain surgery done to them to be a good surgeon. A pastor doesn't need to have lost his mother to be able to minister to a person who has lost their mother. Now, does experience help? Does it, does it help? I mean, yeah. Of course it helps to minister to others. Of course experience helps, but that's not the source. The issue is here, what are the grounds of truth? What are the grounds of truth? Obviously, what's the answer for us Christians? Word of God. Word of God. So we, we need to, here's what I'm saying, we need to live consistently with that. Uh, we, we need not to take other lenses and put those on as we read the Word. You read the Word, that's the lens that you interpret other things. Uh, C.S. Lewis put it this way. This is on your sheet. And this is, just nails it. If you don't understand what I'm saying yet, which I think you do, but this nails it in the, in, in put the nails in the whatever you call it, whatever the saying is. What we learn from experience depends on the kind of philosophy we bring to experience. You see, what we learn from experience depends on the kind of philosophy we bring to experience. You see, just to go back to the gun violence thing, if, if, if I was a victim of gun violence, I would say, how wicked is the human heart? That's what I would say as a Christian. See, my, I'm bringing the Bible, putting it on, and looking at the situation. Yeah, either, either side can use that same act of, of violence to shore up their argument. The one side is this horrible, she was, her mother was taken from her by gun violence. The other guy could say, yeah, if her mom had only had, had been allowed to have a gun, you know, she could have prevented it. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, you, you can go back and forth. Mm-hmm. Right. But with the, the outside, you know, when, when you do what you're talking about, you're allowing the outside experiences to bend the word to what you want, where that should be changing us, not mm-hmm. us changing, right. yeah. changing the word. And, and this whole thing is pivotal in any kind of discussion about this stuff. Like I know a lot about the science of uh, creation and evolution. And you look at anything and you can interpret it from the different pairs of glasses, the creation mm-hmm. pair or the evolutionary pair. Mm-hmm. Like all the layers of, of uh, strata in a rock, you know? It's like, well, this was laid evolutionary view. Their glasses, well, this was laid down over eons of time as, you know, sediment. You know. And the creation says, no, there was a big flood and all the stuff was just going everywhere. And, that's where it all came from. You know, mm-hmm. it's like it's the same. Everybody's seeing the same thing, but they're looking at it with their philosophy, mm-hmm. and and the philosophy is what gives you the interpretation of what you're seeing. Mm-hmm. Right. And so that's why this whole concept of worldview is very important. Right. 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 It's really foundational, and and this is why com- coming coming off of that, it's also why sometimes you'll sit back and hear two people talk. And you're just like, they're talking past each other. This is, they're not making any sense to one another. 
Because they're only they're they're talking up here, but they're they're not getting to any of the actual foundational you know differences. Because their differences are here. That's why they think the way they do up here. So if you continue to talk up here, it's not you're not going to get anywhere most of the time. Yeah, now, angry. if me if say again, just get angry. Right, you just get flustered. But if me and Heath or me and Charlie or me and anyone in this room have a conversation up here um, and we disagree, we can actually come to a, 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 an understanding, even if we agree to disagree, and it could be a good discussion because we have the same foundation, you see. But, but that's why when you're talking to an unbeliever, obviously the goal always, uh, first and foremost, and I'll say this little analogy, I and mean, this little thing I heard once uh, from an evangelist, he said, you know, you'll spend three hours learning the science thing. Talking to an unbeliever. I've seen some people spend three hours with an unbeliever talking about rock layers and the age of the earth. What do they go home doing? You want them to trust in Jesus and they go home Googling rock layers. And yet you want them to trust in Jesus? I said, there you go. And I forgot what my original end point was, but hey. Um, the, goal, the goal is preach, preach the gospel. Um, but, oh, it, it, here's what it was. Preach the gospel, that's the main important thing, because the worldview differences are that big. And at the end of the day, a worldview for a worldview to shift is God has to do it by his power uh, in, in the spirit, uh, by the spirit. Um, uh, but if you want to have a helpful conversation with someone that you're talking to, take it from up here and bring it down here. That's going to help the conversation. Get to the root of the issue. How, how do you know that? How, why do you believe that to be true? You know, and then they say, oh, because I had this experience. Why do you think your experience should dictate what I believe? You see, get deeper, and it's going to be more helpful. And then you can get deeper to what you're saying, too, when you tell them, tell them about Jesus. Right? Well, here's why I think this. Now you can go deeper, straight to the root, which is Christ. Lordship of Christ, grace. All right. Next week, we're going to talk about the importance of having a Christian worldview, why it is so vital, and then we will dive into the different hot topics in the culture uh, different things that Christians are getting hammered on constantly.